think of them as virtues, as indispensable parts of ourselves. Our right to criticize is a sacred right. Our right to condemn is something that we will fight and die for. And yet neither of these, criticism nor condemnation, solve anything. They merely magnify and complicate the problems of living. If we can ease down on this a little and give ourselves a chance to relax and allow the contemplative level to come through, we will find that in a more impersonal attitude, less dominated by destructive intensity, we are in a position to discover workable solutions. Intensity destroys our power to solve. Anger destroys our power to think. Hate destroys our power to love. Fear destroys our power of faith. All things needed to solution are destroyed by their opposites. And the individual who has the negative qualities cannot at the same time sustain the positive ones. He must decide between them. And the amazing thing that he doesn't realize and has never been able to realize is that love is a kindlier, happier thing than hate. We have never seemed to find as much satisfaction in the development of our virtues as we have in catering to our vices. Yet actually, our thoughtfulness, our kindliness, our friendliness, these are the sources of happiness. These are the things which bring us contentment. These are the very conditions we dream about. These are the things men go out in war and fight and die for. Yet, in decision, we do not choose to cultivate them. The moment some temptation to be unhappy comes along, we are perfectly willing to sacrifice our birthright of happiness. Out of the recognition of this situation, we do have the right, if we wish to apply it, of choosing positive and constructive attitudes. We can choose not to gossip. We can choose not to criticize. And we can choose to seek the good in things, realizing always that there is something of good. And furthermore, that the acceptance of the fact of good is the greatest stimulation toward the growth of good. Henry Ford proved in his work with ex-convicts that when you have a faith in a man, you have a greater probability of that man maintaining his own self-respect than when you suspect him. The moment you doubt him, you destroy his faith in himself. The moment we suspect, we create suspicion. Whereas if we have a strong and constructive attitude, we have the greatest and most powerful defense against betrayal. But someone will say, I did have that attitude once, twice, three times, and I was betrayed. Now I'm a hopeless skeptic. I have, I have done things for people, they've turned around and stabbed me in the back. There are a large number of cliches bearing on this point, but we don't need to repeat them all. But the answer again lies in man's ability to detach himself from the things he does. Almost always, uh, when we are so-called betrayed, we are offended. First, because we feel that our own judgment has been wrong. And that's an intolerable situation in itself. We can never forgive the individual who has proved that we are wrong if it is only by failing us in some emergency. Furthermore, we become attached to the things we are doing. We expect results. We demand results. But we live within so small a reference frame that the only results that we can see must be almost immediate ones. 
It is difficult for us to imagine that something, the results of which we cannot see, has results. And nor can we be satisfied with the belief that those results may only reach their harvest long after we have gone. We must have the proof of it right now. All of this, again, being the imposing of our own mind and our own attitudes upon things. We do not do things well, generously, lovingly, and finely, because we expect reward. We do these things because they are the law, and we either keep the law or die from breaking it. The other person's reaction to what we do is according to his own understanding. We are not responsible for his understanding, but we are responsible totally for our own. And if 5,000 persons fail us every day of our lives, that is no excuse for any human being to become cynical. Let's face it. Because we must live with ourselves. And if we do not believe in cynicism, then the failure of other persons cannot make us do that which we know is not right. The moment we permit ourselves to fall into this era, this era of being discouraged, it means that our faith in value is not great enough. On the, uh, this evidence, by the way, is not so uh, remarkable as we might first assume. There are very few persons who have not been given indications of gratitude. There are very few persons who have done great things over a continuous period of time without recognition. There are very few persons whose kind deeds have always gone awry. What we generally again do is promptly forget the kindnesses that have been done to us, the gentlenesses which have returned to us, and when fifty persons are grateful and one is not, that one is the only one we remember. If we look back over our lives, we will realize that we have not been the continuous victims of ingratitude. We have become, we have been the continuous victims of our own attitude toward it. We have willingly and willfully rejected the kindnesses which we should have appreciated in order to nurse the grudges we should have forgotten. Thus, regardless of how we approach it, as Henry Ford found out with his, again, with his criminal, uh, with the criminals or ex-criminals that he took on parole and employed and placed in positions of responsibility, every one of them did not live up to it, but the majority did. And it would be quite possible to build a philosophy of life upon the one who didn't. But that philosophy of life would be wrong because it would forget the dozens and hundreds who proved themselves trustworthy in every way. The same way, if we are negative and recognize and remember only negation, we can prove it, but the proof is not valid because it is a proof based upon a minority incident. It is the magnification of a particular. Whereas the men who did respond and did come through represented a generality, a larger group. And their testimony, 99 to 1 perhaps, is the more valid. And in life, the hundreds of good things that have come to us are more valid than the few unpleasant remembrances that we cannot get out of our systems. So if we take our attitudes and examine life fairly, we will discover grounds for optimism. We will find that this world is not nearly as bad as we are forced it to be by our own thinking. And building a more generous, contemplative relationship with life, we will begin to see that we have been wonderfully blessed and protected through countless emergencies. 
And that also, if we could maintain 